I want to talk about the, the history of communion a little bit. Um, we're not going to get uh, too theological. My wife and I got in a theological, I don't say debate, but a conversation uh, <laughs> la- last week over, over this. And, and uh, it's just, it's great to have a wife that has an opinion. That's wonderful. And she did not win. But uh, if, if, if it came to cancer treatments and how to administer drugs, she would win. But theological debates, generally, I have a little bit of an upper hand on those. But um, generally speaking, um, praise the Lord. So um, before you check out and get all glassy-eyed when we discuss a little bit of history, uh, know that it's very relevant to what we're talking about today. So if you remember, you have uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Jacob uh, had, uh, um, his name was changed. Joseph went to Egypt because of the famine. He was sold into slavery. And the Egyptians stayed in Egypt, or excuse me, the Jews, the Israelites, stayed in Egypt like 430 years, long time. They, they, the reason that that became an issue um, was that they were doing really well because of Joseph you know, this Israelite that was in the house of Potiphar. But then it says a very interesting uh, verse of scripture in Exodus chapter one, verse eight. It says, then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. There, There arose a king who knew not Joseph. That's how I memorized it, King James back in the day. And so what happens was all of the good things that Joseph had done were forgotten, and now the Israelites were in slavery for 400. I, mean, I don't know if you, we have a hard time remembering past our birth year, right? right. right? Americans were pretty, our, our, our memory is, and, and even then, you know, 19, what? Ah, that's, ah. well, that was just 100 years ago. Think 400, they've been in slavery for 430 years, long time. And then, of course, Moses is born. Moses uh, goes out in the wilderness. He has some issues out there. He has a burning bush. He's been commissioned to come back and make, be the deliverer of the children of Israel. And so he comes back having some prestige in the house. And he presents himself to Pharaoh, says, hey, listen, Pharaoh, it's time that my people, meaning the Israelites, we're, we, we got to go home. We want to go back home. Let us go. And of course, Pharaoh, if if you know how he is, he's not a nice man. I mean, when you're in charge of the world, you can do anything. Somebody simply asking you is not reason enough for them to be released. And says, no, it's not going to happen. And so we know that there was then the water that was turned to blood, became undrinkable. In Exodus chapter 7, these are the plagues that came upon Egypt because Pharaoh kept playing around with God. And so I don't know if you have, you know what a life straw is? You know what a life straw is? A life straw is something you can stick into dirty water and drink through it, and it's a big, bulky, fat straw, but it has a filter system in it that you can drink like muddy water, and it filters it as you drink it. I would suggest, by the way, as a side note, that all of you have a life straw or a couple, some water source, that if your water were to stop running in your home for more than a day, that you'd be able to get fresh water. Well, then I would go buy it from Walmart. No, you wouldn't, because everyone would be buying it from Walmart. Just a heads up to you, get yourself some sort of water filtration system. Well, you sound like a prepper. I am. The, the, biggest, the biggest prepper on the face of the earth was Noah. That turned out okay for him, didn't it? All right, I, I'm way far afield. That's all from water to blood. We're going to get to the point here in a second. We got frogs. Frogs came next in Exodus 8. Now, a frog in the backyard, that's cute. A frog on your kitchen counter, no. A thousand frogs in your house, that's another story. Gnats and lice came in Exodus chapter 8, and they didn't have skin so soft, or Avon uh, something or other, the buffalo gnats. Now imagine they just, you walk out, boom, they're on you. A plague of gnats and lice. Plague of flies. I can't sleep if there's one fly in my bedroom. Yeah? Cheryl had, Cheryl had one land in her mouth once, that's why I think... She'll get that fly. I said, I'm gonna get that fly. She said, then it landed on her mouth. She said, she's like, (laughs) I need to go on the counter and get that get delivered from that or something. (laughs) 
Then uh, you have Exodus 9. Moses came back, said, let my people go. And he, keep, he, he came back on his word. And so now the death of all the cattle, the horses, the donkey, the camels, all the livestock died. Then boils. I don't watch the show. I just see it in my, in my lineup on my television. Dr. Pimple Popper something or whatever. Uh uh-uh, uh, that's not me. Some of you are like, oh, that's so awesome. Did you see that? It's like, no, I don't like that stuff. I don't ever, I've never seen the show. Hail, I looked it up. The largest hailstone, eight inches in diameter and weighed two and a quarter pounds. And it fell in Vivian, South Dakota. Now, I'm not saying the hailstones that fell in Egypt during the plague were that size, but they could have been. I mean, you don't have to be hitting, getting hit by a bowling ball, falling out of heaven. Then the plague of locusts. By the way, I just read last week that this coming summer is the summer of the cicadia, right? So get ready for that. And there's like, you know, you got five or six or eight or 10 or 25 in your front tree. Imagine the whole front yard covered, eating everything they, they can find. That's the plague. Then darkness. Not duskness, darkness. It says in the text, listen to this, all of Egypt for three days, darkness so dense that people couldn't see one another move. That's how dark it was. And still, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then he said, Moses came back, said, here's what's gonna happen now. There's gonna be death that comes to each and every house in Egypt. The firstborn is gonna die, animals and people. And so you better let us go. And so, uh, and they were whether slaves or, f- or free. But he went back and he told the Israelites, if you would put the blood of a spotless lamb on the doorpost of your house, this death that I've just prophesied will not come to you. It will pass over you and you'll be saved. Now, we all know how the story ends. But I, as, as a pastor, I think somewhere when Moses said, here's what we're going to do, there was somebody that says, I don't want to do that. Blood? Eh, on my house? Are you kidding me? I just put a fresh coat of paint on that thing. I'm not even smearing blood all over my house. He says, if you do this, then it wasn't a given. There was something for them to do to put the blood on the doorpost of the house. So when the angel of death came, that angel would pass over their house and the firstborn in their home would not die. Who does that Moses think he is telling us what we need to be doing? Or, yeah, I just didn't get around to it today. I'll do it tomorrow. These are all sermons I'll preach at a later date. I don't have time to unpack all of those, but because we're, we're driving someplace and we're gonna get there in just a few minutes. So here's what happened. They applied blood of the sacrificed lamb to the doorposts of their home. A young male, without defect, slaughtered them. Exodus 12, 7. Do we have that? I think we do. Yeah. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the doorframe of the house where they eat the lamb. Moving on to verse 12 and 13. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn. This is God speaking, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods, small g, of Egypt. And I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign. Signs always point, remember that. It's gonna be pointing at something. The blood will be a sign to you on your house where you are. And when you see it... Uh, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, pass over, pass over, underline it. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, what's really interesting is the next verse, even before it happens, God establishes an ordinance. Now, in, in, in the Christian church, there's only two ordinances. The ordinance of death by symbolism in the water, which is water baptism, and this ordinance a communion, the Lord's table. There's only two. And God establishes this lasting ordinance 1,500 years before Jesus. 
Okay, here it is, verse 30. Pharaoh and all of his officials, all of his officials and all of the Egyptians got up burning uh, during the night and there was a loud wailing. In Egypt, there was not a house, not a house without someone dead. Imagine your neighborhood. What would, the, would you be able to hear that? Maybe. If one child in every household in your neighborhood died, during the night, Pharaoh, 31, summoned Moses and Aaron. Hey, said, all right, all right, up, get out of here. Leave, leave, go. You, go worship the Lord as you've requested, verse 32. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said. Go, 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 and just bless us, bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry, get out of the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast, this is why it's unleavened. Leaven is what we talk about in yeast. If you put yeast into bread, it rises. If you don't put yeast, leaven in it, it stays flat. Hence, we use crackers, things that are unyeasted, unleavened bread for this very reason. And they carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in, clothes, in, in uh, clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And you know what happened? The Lord made it so that the Egyptians favorably disposed themselves toward the people of Israel and gave them what they asked for. So the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. I know your son is dying. I know your daughter is dying in the back room. But uh, would you happen to have any gold in your safe? Would you have any silver in your safe? Do you have any fine linen? We'd like to have those. And they, go, and they say, sure, here it is. The Lord disposed them to give all of their valuables to the Israelites as they fled. So I'm going to give you, uh, how, because it's just so impressed upon me. Imagine, this commandment has been given Moses, and you have to, certain dates in your mind, like 1500, you've got to put that, like in your theological dictionary, your personal dictionary, just like 70 AD, just like certain dates, like 1776, your birth date, 1500, just think Moses, 1500. Like when did the 10 commandments get written? Well, Moses wrote them in 1500. 1500 BC, this is when this happened. So what, think about this. Then they flee, they go out in the desert, right? And when we're out in the desert, uh, Aaron just read the whole Old Testament. When they're out there, boom, God gives directions on set up a tent or a tabernacle. Those are interchangeable words. And the reason of that tent and the reason for that tabernacle is so that we can worship the Lord out in the wilderness. And we sacrifice the lambs. We sacrifice the lambs. At 1500 BC, then we come into Israel now remember what happens, Joshua and Caleb and taking the land and blah, blah, blah. Now David and Solomon, David wants to build a temple, he can't. Solomon builds the most beautiful temple building ever created in all of humanity at 1000 BC. That means for 500 years, longer than they were in captivity and much longer than I can think, but for 500 years they were slaughtering lambs in a tent called a tabernacle in the wilderness. Then they come into the promised land and Solomon builds a temple and that's where they begin to sacrifice the lambs at the year 1000 BC. Then what happens is, you know, uh, they get taken into captivity and Israel splits into two and there's about 85 years of, of destruction and the temple comes down and they're over Nebuchadnezzar, you know those stories over there? And then remember Nehemiah went to come back and rebuild the wall, that all happens right in there. And so what happens in 516 is they come back and they rebuild this, the temple. It's just, it's just called the second temple. The first temple is called Solomon's temple. The second temple is called the second temple. And it happened at five, it's called 500 BC. So watch the timeline. 1500, the tent, 1000, the temple, torn down, rebuilt, and now we're at 500 we have the second temple. The second temple is the temple that Jesus would go to. The second temple was standing for the 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. The prophets were speaking, remember? Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi, is the last book of the Old Testament. And after that, you've got 400 years of prophetic silence. 
Nothing's been happening except prophetically, every day at the temple, the sheep were slaughtered. The sheep were slaughtered. For another 500 years. What's going on? Put yourself in the year where Jesus now is walking by the Jordan River and John the Baptist says to the crowd, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Up until this point, all the blood that's being shed is only covering your sin. The blood covers your sin. It's sprinkled on the mercy seat as an offering. For how long? 1,500 years until John the Baptist says, look here, guys, the, there, there's a lamb right there, the, la- the spotless lamb of God, the lamb. God has to make an offering, a sin offering, and this offering, listen to what he says, that will take away, not cover your sin, but expunge your record. Any ex-criminals in the house? Right? Expunge your record. So if we go back and we look and we go, did what happened there? Uh, mm, I can't find it. It's not there. It's been removed. So that's quite, and then that's what causes the ruckus in Jerusalem. Imagine, here's this guy that's now being identified as the king of the Jews, the lamb of God who's gonna take away the sin. Man, the apple cart is getting wobbly. For 50, and now it's happening in Jerusalem. And this guy's going around from town to town, to village to village. He's healing people. He's delivering people. Demon-possessed people are getting free. Dead little girls are getting up. Uh, miraculous water to wine. Walking on water. W- issue of blood. Paralysis, blindness, leprosy, and on and on and on. And it starts, it starts building a little momentum in Jerusalem for three years. He's about to be offered up as the sacrifice halfway through that last year of his life. And so it's the Passover. It's the time because, listen, this is so crazy. Jesus celebrated the Passover for 33 years. And now he says to his disciples in Luke chapter 22, verse 7, also in Mark 14, also in Mark 28, In Matthew 26, it's all throughout the Gospels. It says this, verse seven. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. They were going to gather to remember once again what? What were they going to do? They were going to remember the night that they escaped captivity and death. That's all that, that's what that was for. We are going to get together, like we get together at Christmas. They got together at Passover and they said, we're going to celebrate. Remember guys, 1,500 years ago, Pharaoh had us under his thumb, but we escaped slavery and we escaped death, certainly. God is good. So they celebrate with their unleavened bread and their wine. This is what they were, Jesus had just commissioned Peter. Go find a room. We're gonna go celebrate the Passover. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And this is how it went down. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance, underline that. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the, ooh, this is, a, this, is a, this is something underline worthy. Here's the cup, it's the new covenant. They've had not had that phrase. They've not had that phrase for a very long time. This is the new covenant, and do this whenever you drink it in remembrance, remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, what you're doing, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, 
Whoever eats this bread, drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, you need to like, just stop and just think about what you're doing. Not, oh, everybody else is doing it. No, this, this is... Let me just take a second here. The people that came up on this platform and joined this fellowship didn't join the church. I'll try it again. The people that came up on this platform did not join this church. You all joined the church the day you got saved. That's what the church is, right? We are the church. You, well, I want to be a member of the church. Are you saved? Well, congratulations. You're a member of the church. We're just talking about membership in the fellowship. There's a difference. And so they come together and say, listen, this is why communion is an open communion. It's part of the family. If you're a visitor here today, but you love Jesus, this table is for you, man. It's like Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, all wrapped up in one. You're part of us. You're part of the family. Well, I'm not a member of that church. Listen, I was raised in a denomination where you could not take communion at that church unless you were a member of the church. You ever, know, you ever heard that? Yeah. Now, well, well, that's just terrible. That's just horrible. That's just horrible. I, I understand where they're coming from. You know why I understand they're, where they're coming from? Because of this verse. The leadership of that church have decided the way we will make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus is that we have vetted you. You become a member of our fellowship. And therefore, we will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have a relationship with the Lord. So that's why we say if you're not a member here, which I don't agree with, I'm just giving you their rationale. You know, we can think about things without necessarily agreeing on things. And if we disagree, it doesn't mean I hate you. I don't hate people to do that. I hate the devil, that's what I hate, that uses things like communion, which is supposed to draw us all together, to divide us. Like water baptism, you sprinkle, you dunk. How about we just water baptize and we'll take it up later with the Lord? I'm not here to divide. Well, speak in tongues, not speak in tongues. Okay, okay, fine, fine. You have your, listen, Let's just get along. We're a family, as Ryan so beautifully said it. We're a family. And so if you love the Lord, you love Jesus, he's your Lord and Savior, then this, this table is for you if this is the first Sunday you've ever been here. I'll keep reading my text. Verse 20, is that where I left off? 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread, drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to what? Say, Examine. A man ought to examine, everyone ought to examine themselves before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. You're eating from a table that is not your table. Like if I, you know walked off the platform and across the street and opened up the front door and sat down eating out of somebody's refrigerator, they'd go, you don't belong here. <laughs> Same thing. It's for the family. It's for the family. This is why many of you, you can actually be weak, sick, metaphorically, die, fall asleep, it says in King James, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Here it is. But if we judged ourselves, we would not con come under judgment. So this is the moment of reflection where you go, man, now, I'll tell you, because of my upbringing, I used to think my sins got forgiven only when we took communion. Like, for some reason, I felt like, as a kid, I was like, oh, I got to take communion because that's where my sins get forgiven. It's like, that's where you recognize that your sins are already forgiven, right? So there is that element to it. Now, does this, th does this wine or this juice, and by the way, we do have wine and juice. You know why? Because I don't want to fight. I'm a lover in my heart. I'm a lover. I don't want to fight. Well, it's, it's wine. He didn't, did, 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 okay, fine, fine, fine. We have juice for you. Well, it was, it, was, it was wine. Well, then we have wine for you. We're not, listen, you're not going to go to heaven or hell whether or not you think it was wine or it's juice. You're missing the point of what we're doing here. The very thing God instituted to bring us together, I refuse to let it divide us. So that's why many years ago I said, I ain't going to fight. We're going to do both. And they can do what they want. I forgot what I was talking about, but that was a really good point. <laughs> Aren't you glad it's not a show? Aren't you glad it's not a show? I'm so glad it's not a show. All right. Um, oh, uh, 
Yeah, I talked about water and wine. Yeah, okay, I guess that's enough for now on that. I had some other things, but we're, we're, we want to bring the worship team back up in a minute and give everybody plenty of time to enjoy. So, all right, here we are. That's the evening that Jesus said, after a dinner, he took the cup and he said, this is, guys, my blood, my body. He is, and this one's is happening. This is happening on the celebration of Passover. He's saying, I am that. And then, of course, if you have time, I'd encourage you to, to just write down Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. Because those two chapters flesh all of this out and draw the correlation between, it, it, takes, it takes the Old Testament, watch, here, here's some theology, simple stuff, watch this. The Old Testament is the New Testament, concealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament, concealed. So when we're talking about these things, they are types, they are symbols, they are foreshadowing of what's to come. The Old Testament is the New Testament, concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. This is what's happening to us right here in this moment in Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 9. But I have one verse just to to settle the matter. And if you want to talk about it more, we can later. Here it is, Hebrews 8, 13. By calling this covenant new, is what the Spirit of the Lord says, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. In other words, we get it now. (laughs) We don't have to have a shadow. We get the real thing. We don't have to have a prototype. We don't have to have a a symbol, something kind of foggy and, 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 and mystic and hidden. No, it's a revelation that Jesus, the sp- behold the lamb, was slain, his blood on the doorposts of our life, allow freedom from slavery and captivity, celebrate with me the Passover. Anybody else getting excited? Celebrate with me the Passover of death on your life and slavery and bondage to sin. Amen. The first one was obsolete in what, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Five things you got to write down, and then we're going to take communion. Number one, the things we do if we confess Jesus as the Lamb of God in this moment. We examine, we eat, we drink, we remember, we proclaim. This is what we do in communion every time we gather. This is why we celebrate communion. And you can do it at home. Celebrate communion at home. Have communion with your family. Gather your kids around. In fact, you know what? You can, you can celebrate at McDonald's today at lunch. Why do we pray when we eat? God, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for how you provided for me. Thank you, God, for sustaining me. I remember your sacrifice. Thank you for this food in Jesus' name. Amen. And you say, now, it's not whenever, it's not whatever you happen to be eating and drinking. I think you can have communion with a Pop-Tart and a Diet Coke. That may be a too much for you. If it is, I'm in the family, deal with me. I'm not having Diet Coke and I'm not having Pop-Tarts. I'm just a little, hi- a little hyperbole to get our juices flowing, to think, think. It's not the juice, it's not the bread. We do this to remember, we ex- first we examine ourselves. Then what we do is we eat and we remember what he did in his body for us. By his stripes, we're healed. Then after we ate, after dinner, he took the cup and he supped and he blessed it and he, and he said, this is my body. So we drink the wine, which is his body. It represents that. Oh, I know where I was going about 15 minutes ago when I got off of that bunny trail. <laughs> I'm back. <sighs> Just push pause. Just for a second. The, the, the wine or the juice does not become the, the blood of Jesus. The, the little wafer, and I splurged because I got the little fancy ones with the cross on them for y'all. Today. I'm just saying, we went all out. I know Miles just gets you those Ritz crackers, those gluten-free stuff. That's, that's, that's all good. But we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing some Catholic Lutheran stuff up here today, man. We can jest, right? So the, so, the, so, the, so the bread does not actually physically become trans, transubstance, transubstantiation is the Catholic terminology. And this is Catholicism. You say, well, I'm Catholic. I don't believe that. Well, okay, this is what your 
religion believes that in Catholicism, they believe that the juice or the wine becomes, physically becomes the blood of Jesus. And the bread, when it's broken by the priest and he elevates it and he prays that prayer, at that moment, physically actually becomes the flesh of Jesus. Well, I don't agree with that. Well, then come on over to the Protestant side where Martin Luther said, let's reform that thought. Let's reform that thought. I don't believe we're going to re-crucify Christ every time we take communion. So we had a reformation in 1500, 1570. All right. Now I'm back to where I was before. Here's what we're doing. Gosh, that's, so, that's, that's rich stuff. Stuff we need to know. All right. So we confess Jesus as Lamb of God. What, how, what, we, we're, what we're about to do, examine ourselves. And Miles, why don't you come up? He's going to lead us in prayer. Worship team, come back up. You're going to lead us in prayer. And you're going to be excused in a minute to come down and I'll give you direction. So you're going to drink the wine. Then you're going to remember, you're going to remember the sacrifice. So what is that? It's like, go, watch this. You've seen people walk before. Look right here just for a second. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. You've been, to the, you've, been to the, you've been to the cemetery and you went and saw grandma's tombstone, right? You made a pilgrimage and you saw a thing that reminded you of that person. And you, you were happy and you were sad. I said, you were happy? Ah, oh, it's grandpa, it's grandma. It's, oh, it's, it's, and then you're like, oh. And they did so much for me. They were so awesome, you know. They, they whatever, they did all these wonderful things for me. This is a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. It's a happy, sad thing. And then, and whenever we do this, we proclaim his death until he returns. That's why we do it on Sunday morning. We do it in prayer meeting. Every once in a while, we incorporate it into our regular service. But on Sunday mornings, once a month, first of the month, Miles comes, he leads us in communion in, in about what we're going to experience here in just a minute. So, at that Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Communion is a call to come and die. After Jesus resurrected, he was standing on the shoreline and the disciples were out there fishing. They fished all night. They didn't catch anything. Jesus yells out, try the other side, which would irritate any other normal fisherman. I've been out here all night and catch anything, but they did. They threw the net to the other side, caught 153 fish. It's recorded in scripture. There's 153 fish. Peter goes, Psh, I know who that is. That must be Jesus. He hops out of the boat, Psh, starts swimming to Jesus. And then the boat catches up to him. He says, give me some of those fish and I'll cook those fish. And Jesus says these words, come and dine. He could have easily said, come and die. Just take the N out of that. And after that, you know what happened that, what happened that morning? Is when, when Jesus reinstated Peter. You know I love you, Lord. He's feeding my sheep. I love you, Lord. Feeding my sheep. Peter gets reinstated, and that's the end of the book of John. Just like that. Come and dine. That's your invitation today. Come and dine. Come and die.